What's going on, man? Welcome back to the basement. I'm Ron, and today we're going to talk through the 2025 rookie class. Now, I know you're going to say, Ron, the 2024 NFL draft is in like two weeks. Why would we talk about the 2025 class? But with the rookie drafts happening in Dynasty Leagues as soon as next month, you know, the Monday after the NFL draft, it's important to talk about the 2025 class because 2025 firsts are going to be flying like hotcakes, right? You're going to be on the clock at the 104 and someone's going to offer you the 108 in a 2025 first or Drake London in a 2025 first. Well, without looking at the 2025 class, we don't really know how to value those picks, right? The 2023 and 2024 draft classes, those rookie picks, those rookie firsts have been gold in Dynasty, right? You have to give up your firstborn, an arm, a leg, your first down payment on your mortgage, all has to go towards those picks. Well, is that the case with 2025? That's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to break down the wide receivers, running backs, quarterbacks, tight ends, everything you need to know so we can value these picks correctly moving into rookie draft season. So with all that being said, if you enjoy, make sure down below, subscribe, leave a like. Let's go. Now, if you're a true sicko, if you are a pervert out there in Debbie Leagues and you want to know about the 2025 class, the whole reason I'm doing this video or why I even feel qualified in some sense to do this video is on the Patreon, I just ran the 2025 classes and the 2026 class through the RS grading system, which is my prospect model. It's not going to be perfect. They're fragile, admittedly, but it's at least a first look at what these classes are going to look like. So if you want access to those RS grades, that's all on Patreon, patreon.com slash Ron Stewart. For the true sickos, that's gold and above because running stuff through the 2025 and 2026 classes, it took me a while. Now, the RS grades, for those that don't know, I tier prospects into legendary, elite, gold, silver, and bronze. And it's kind of the lens we're going to look through this draft class with where, you know, I'm going to be mentioning, you know, this running back or these wide receivers might have a path to being an elite prospect or a legendary prospect. What that means, legendary is right for, this is the wide receiver hit rates, but it's pretty much the same across the board. Legendary is your Bijans, your Marvin Harrison Juniors, those class of guys. Elite, step down, right? Elite would be uh, Brian Thomas Jr.'s elite. In the class before that, uh, you know, JSN was elite. Uh, Drake London, Garrett Wilson, those guys are elite. Gold's a step down. Gold in this class would be like Keon Coleman, and then Silver is just like your bottom of the barrel type of guys. Now, when we talk about this class, we're going to kind of go through each position, strongest position first with the wide receivers. And this class for wide receivers is really strong. I would say that's the focal point of this class in 2025. You have two at the top in Luther Burden. And I'm going to be honest with you guys. These guys are 2025 guys. So if I screw up a name, I screw up a name. We have Tedder, Tedderoa McMillan. Please let me know in the comments how to say that guy's name. But these guys were two huge recruits, right? Luther Burden III goes to Missouri, a five-star recruit. Tedderoa McMillan, four-star recruit, goes to Arizona. Both guys are top five wide receivers in these this class, and they both absolutely balled out this year. You have Luther Burden, who five-star guy. He's kind of like he kind of reminds me of like a Malik Neighbors, Debo Samuel type, where. This past year, he ran a lot of his routes out of the slot. He's this like explosive playmaker, missed tackles force type of guy, yards with the catch kind of guy. Uh, he had 86 catches, 1,210 yards, and nine touchdowns with a 91 PFF grade. That was third in the country ahead of both Marvin Harrison Jr. and Roma Dunze. Then you have like a more traditional outside X receiver in McMillan, where he is 6'5", 210 pounds is what he's listed at. You have to remember as well, these are fudged a little bit, so he might be more like 6'4", 6'3", but still really good stuff. He was tied for the second most contested catches at 17. He had 63 first downs this year, which was third only behind Malik Neighbors and Roma Dunze, <coughs> which we learned with Ryan Heath that first downs matter. He was an engine for this Arizona offense. He had 1,396 receiving yards, and that was the fourth most in college football. These guys are both absolute studs. One of the biggest... Uh, metrics I use in my RS grade database and my RS grade model is receiving yards per team pass attempt. And that is very simple. It's kind of like yards per out run, but it's just receiving yards divided by your team's pass attempt. So all that it's measuring is your dominance on the offense and then also your efficiency within the offense. So it's like yards per out run where it's dominance and efficiency, but we don't have per route data all the way back to 2007 in my database. So this is a, a, 
an easier version of that. And I just wanted to put them up next to Marvin Harrison Jr. and Malik Neighbors. And through two years, what Luther Burden did last year in receiving yards per team pass attempt and what McMillan did, they're both in that like three plus yards per team pass attempt area that Marvin Harrison Jr. also had in his second year. Now Malik Neighbors is a little bit weird where he had a great year one and then really popped in year three after like a fine year two. We could definitely see that in this class. I will say McMillan was the best of the bunch as a freshman. Luther Burden, not as great as a freshman. You can see the, those year two plots on this chart are really, really strong. Now, the guys that I think could be Malik Neighbors where, you know, they had a fine year two, but I think like a, a, a massive breakout could catapult them to top 10 draft capital are Evan Stewart and Mika Buka, or Emeka Ibuka. Now, I will say with a Burden right now in my RS grade database, he's elite. With the upside to be legendary, I would say the same for McMillan, uh, but like it likes him slightly less, if that makes sense. Two guys that are elite as of right now, which is crazy, two years uh, a year out, with the upside to be legendary. Then we have Evan Stewart and Emeka Egbuka, who are more so golds with upside to be elite, if that makes sense. And when we talk about Evan Stewart and Emeka Egbuka, they are really highly thought of in the Debbie community. And Debbie's honestly a great way for us to get our information for these next classes because they are, Debbie, if you don't know, they are drafting players straight out of the high school. So their rookie draft is actually high schoolers. So they are wheeling and dealing college players and like their Debbie pool that kind of act as rookie picks. And we can see here eight of the top 12 picks in this April Debbie mock draft by Kevin. He's at the boys underscore 22 on Twitter. He does great work. He's with football guys. He's like one of their main Debbie guys, someone that I like to follow when it comes to the college prospects and all of that. He did a, I believe like a creator, uh, like a Devi influencer, Devi Twitter account mock draft. And they had eight wide receivers in the top 12, which just goes to show how strong wide receiver is right now, just across the board in these future classes. And of those eight wide receivers, four of them are eligible for 2025. We talked about Burden. We talked about McMillan, but then we have Evan Stewart, who was the 102. And we have Emeka Egbuka, who was the 107. Both are really, really, really good as well. Like I know I mentioned McMillan and Burden at the top, but these guys are also really strong. Both of them, five-star recruits, top of their class. You can see here, Emeka Egbuka was the first guy in his class, five-star recruit. Then on top of that, you get Evan Stewart, five-star recruit ahead of Luther Burden. He commits to Texas A&M. Emeka Egbuka goes to Ohio State. Both guys, you know, top dudes coming out of high school. And they at least did enough in their careers that, you know, we've had guys who are number one in their class in recruiting rankings or recruiting rankings aren't all that solid regardless. But if you are a five-star and then you also ball out, that's huge. Like Bijan was a five-star. Um, I was going to say the same. I think Neighbors and uh, Marvin Harrison Jr. were four stars along with Roma Dunze. But with Evan Stewart, uh, he's a little bit like he, he's kind of frail. He's like six foot. He's probably more 5'11", 175 pounds, which is a little bit of an issue. But we have seen recently with guys like your Tank Dells of the world and Devontae Smiths, it's not a huge deal. Emeka Egbuka, much more of your prototypical. He's 6'1", 205 pounds, which is pretty big for the NFL these days. His issue is that he's a senior, right? So he's not going to have that early declare. But we see with these Ohio State guys like Chris Olave, now with Roma Dunze as well. With the COVID year, it's not as big of a deal as it used to be. And we kind of look at what their production is in terms of receiving yards per team pass attempt. There's a lot to be excited about. Now, first we look at Evan Stewart, and we put them next to Luther Burden, McMillan, uh, Malik Neighbors, Marvin Harrison Jr., and Roma Dunze in receiving yards per team pass attempt. You can see Evan Stewart had the best freshman year of the bunch at Texas A&M. Then he has a down year two where, you know, he's right there next to Malik Neighbors in year two, but not quite in that Burden, Harrison Jr., McMillan area. And that's because he had a down year at Texas A&M. They also had a weird year where I believe that their coach got fired midway through. A lot of them sort of transferred out. But he's transferring to Oregon, which is really fun. Oregon brought in uh, two two of like the, the biggest transfer quarterback recruits available. They are a team that could be really, really fun next year. And you could see him pop kind of like Troy Franklin did this past year and be a first round pick. So Evan Stewart definitely got to keep an eye on. And then also Emeka Egbuka, where his year two rivals McMillan, Harrison Jr. and Burden, but his year three was pretty terrible. He's someone that could be like Roma Dunze, where I really do think he could have, like if he dominates that Ohio State wide receiver room where they have, you know, they're going to have Carnell Tate, who's like the next coming along with Jeremiah Smith, true freshman, the next coming, 
uh, along with Brandon Innes. Like, they have a stacked wide receiver room. If he goes out there and is the top dog in that wide receiver room and has a Roma Dunze type run and Ohio State makes a run in the college football playoffs, it wouldn't shock me if he was a top 10 pick and was looked at like Roma Dunze is right now. We're talking just strictly ceilings of this class. I do think that he could be there, and I'm never going to really bet against Ohio State wide receivers. Now, moving on to the honorable mentions for the wide receivers here, I have kind of a jumble that I all just put on this chart. First, we'll talk about, uh, and, and these guys that I think could be like Franklin and Malik Neighbors, where, you know, Malik Neighbors is obviously the highest range of outcomes, but guys who are like fine through two years and then have that monster year three. Uh, first, we'll talk about Barry on Brown and Dane Key. They have the two best freshman seasons on this list. They're both Kentucky wide receivers, bo- both four stars. A little bit weird that they're competing with each other. You have uh, Dane Key, who had the better year two. Barry on Brown had the better year one. Both fine guys that are probably going to be in the top three round mix. We also have uh, Matthew Golden and Isaiah Bond. Both guys were four stars in that 2022 recruiting class. And they're both transferring to Texas to fill the A.D. Mitchell and Xavier Worthy holes that are being left behind. So that's really exciting as well. Uh, Golden popped in year one where he has the third best number on this list. Down year two, but he was at Houston, which is kind of a weird spot for him. Uh, And then you have Isaiah Bond as well, who was at Alabama, awful year one, really good year two now transferring to Texas. Those are two guys that are going to be in a national stage. I believe Texas will be in the SEC next year. You have Quinn Ewers there who brought them to a college football playoff. So going to be a lot of hype around that Texas team. And then you have Antonio Williams. He had a really strong first year as a four-star recruit, uh, down second year. But if he pops in year three, he's someone that could also go in the top three rounds. Now, somebody I will I'll throw out there as a wild card here is going to be Travis Hunter. Uh, he's really someone I, I don't know how to value him, right? When I ran all these guys through the RS grades, Travis Hunter is the fourth best wide receiver in this class. The issue is that he plays both ways, which is crazy. He was the number one recruit in his class. So he was the five-star among five stars as a two-way wide receiver corner. Of course, Deion Sanders recruits him to Jackson State. He then brings him to Colorado. And last year at Colorado, he got hurt midseason. But before that, he was an absolute monster This first game was insane. Uh, Sam Monson puts it together well, where he had 145 total snaps. He had 13 targets, 11 catches, 119 yards, and seven first downs as a wide receiver. As a corner, he defended nine targets. He allowed three catches. He had an interception and three PBUs. No NFL wide receiver or corner played more than 101 snaps all of last season, let alone had an awesome game on the other side of the ball at the same time. Second best graded player on offense, second best graded player on defense, absolute Shohei Otani madness from Hunter in 100 degree Texas heat versus TCU. Really, really impressive. And I think that that shows his upside. Now, the likelihood that he can come to the NFL and do that every Sunday where he's playing both sides the entire time is tough. So then it comes down to a few outcomes. You have the nuts outcome that I think is really unlikely that he goes to the NFL and decides to play both ways like full stop, you know, full snap counts on both sides. I I don't know that that could happen. What I will say is that he's so talented, he's already in the mix to be a top 10 pick, if not a top five pick. So he's going to get draft capital. He's going to get drafted highly. It's a matter of what position he plays. One of the doomsday scenarios is that he just goes and plays defense. The other is that he plays defense and then sparingly on offense, and you can never really use him in fantasy. So you have all that going on. It's a very small chance that he decides, you know what, I'm just going to devote my NFL career to playing wide receiver. But... Maybe he looks at the money in the contracts, right? I think that wide receivers probably get paid more than corners at this point, but we will see with the Sauce Gardner contract. And I think, I don't know if Patrick Sertain's been paid yet, but I think that he's going to look at that Justin Jefferson deal and he's going to think really long and hard about it. So something to to think about, I I wouldn't pencil him in as someone to consider for this class when you're sort of trading 2025 first, but he is a wild card that could really make things interesting because I think if he plays a full season as a wide receiver and then gets drafted top 10, he would be elite in the RS grades as well. Now, moving on to the RBs, this running back class is really good. It's a massive, massive improvement from 2024. You have about five running backs who could very easily next year either be drafted in round one or have an elite RS grade. Uh, You have a couple, you have have two groups. You have the smaller school mega producers, but we have seen those pan out in the past where like Rashad White was a first round pick. I'm trying to think of like more recently of like smaller school guys getting drafted highly. But you get what I'm saying. I mean, Brees Hall out of Iowa State 
you know, Iowa State's not really a big school either. So I think that there is some some paths for them. And then you also have the big school running back, super highly touted recruits uh, at the top. Now, when we talk about the big school guys, you have Quinshawn Judkins, you have Trevion Henderson, and you have Nick Singleton out of Penn State. Trevion Henderson's out of Ohio State. Quinshawn Judkins is now his teammate at Ohio State. And then Nick Singleton out of Penn State. And when we look at that Debbie mock draft uh, from earlier, you can see of the top 12 picks, four of them are running backs. All four of them are in the 2025 draft class, which is really, really exciting because, like, we have a spot right now. The running back class, you know, you have you have a young core right now, right? Like Brees, Bijan, Gibbs, that's all cool. McCaffrey at the peak of his powers, but then after that, there's just like this massive, massive like wasteland of running backs at this point. And I think that this class could be the one that injects some youth and some talent back into the NFL. And the first guy that I'll say is probably my RB1 as of today. But the thing is, like, there's genuinely five dudes in this class, or really more like four dudes in this class that have a real case to be the RB1, uh, which again is really exciting because Quinshawn Judkins is nothing to sneeze at. When we look at what he did at Ole Miss, right? So he's transferring to Ohio State after two years at Ole Miss. That first year is one of the all-time years in SEC history. He had over 1,500 rushing yards in the SEC as a true freshman sharing the backfield with NFL running back Zach Evans, who was a junior. Insanity. I don't know why I can't talk today. But the issue is, is that he had a little bit of a down year too, right? That yard for here goes from 5.7 to 4.3. That's not great, but still over 1,000 rushing yards, still 15 touchdowns in the rushing game. 22 catches as well is good. You know, that's not monster receiving upside, but 15 and 22 catch seasons, not terrible. Now transfers to Ohio State and is going to be on like a national, national stage, which is good news. Now he's going to be sharing a backfield with Trevion Henderson, which is kind of a good thing for them where... I don't think either of them need to have monster, monster seasons. As long as they look good when they're on the field, I think that will be exciting for them because you can kind of have like a Sony Michelle, Nick Chubb kind of deal going on where like neither of them are like balling out of control, but scouts just love them because, you know, Quinshawn Judkins first year. And then you have Trevion Henderson, who was the number one RB in his class. He was a five-star recruit ahead of, you know, Will Shipley's in this class. We'll talk about Donovan Edwards early. He was a five-star recruit, and he also, like Quinshawn Judkins, had a monster first year. He had over 1,500 yards from scrimmage as a uh, freshman, 27 catches, 19 touchdowns, absolute monster in 2021, but hasn't been able to get back there ever since. So now you can kind of take some of the load off of him. He's had some injury issues. Quinshawn Judkins can get more efficiency in this Ohio State offense. They're both going to be on a national stage. And then the one that's like the lesser of the two of them that I think some uh, like sickos and scouts really like Nick Singleton. Uh, he's a Penn State running back. He was the number one running back recruit in his class. Good size as well. He was listed at six foot two twenty four. He'll he's probably more like six foot two fifteen, but that's a great size for him. He catches passes. Five star recruit. All of that good stuff. And we look at these running backs and we compare them to your Bijan Robinsons, your Brees Halls, your Jameer Gibbs in adjusted yards per team play, which is just rushing yards plus receiving yards times two divided by team play. So how much of your offense are you taking up? How efficient are you within your offense? And then also it it leans towards receiving upside. All really good. One of the biggest inputs in my RS grade model. And you can see here, Trevion Henderson and Quinshawn Judkins in year one, both ahead of Brees and Bijan. Year two, that's where these guys didn't really do great, right? Like Quinshawn Judkins, Singleton, and Trevion Henderson all like you know, by the dotted line, but not up there with your Bijan, Brees, and Gibbs. And then that final year, Trevion Henderson actually played pretty well this year up there with Gibbs. We'll see where Singleton and Judkins go in year three, and we'll see where Trevion Henderson goes in year four. But these are all guys that I think, you know, their stats aren't going to be amazing, but because of their pedigree and because of the school they're coming from, I think that NFL scouts will like them. To me, they're all in like your gold with the upside to be elite running back prospects and all in the mix to go like day two at the latest next year now this takes us to our small school guys and these guys are very exciting but they can fizzle out we've seen it before with like your chuba hubbards of the world your uh i guess you could kind of say bryce loves you could say i don't know there's there's definitely small school guys like jamar jefferson's that kenny gainwell is another one where you know we, we get very excited about them and then they just sort of slip but these guys are absolute monsters first we'll talk about uh this is going to be ashton jaunty Again, let me know if I'm saying these names wrong, but 
I mean, this is insane. He plays at Boise State. As a true freshman, he had 821 rushing yards, seven touchdowns, and 14 catches. That's fine. First year, that's strong. And then year two, monster. 220 carries, 1,347 yards, 14 touchdowns, and then 43 catches. He's also listed as 5'9", 215 pounds. So he has size. I mean, Boise State's not terrible. Like, we have seen, uh, like, Doug Martin come out of Boise State. So they're, you know, they're not too, too small. But that's monstrous, monstrous uh, production. And then same thing with Ollie Gordon. Ollie Gordon goes to Oklahoma State. Lesser of a year one, right? Like, that year one's not really anything. But then in year two... 1,700 rushing yards, 21 rushing touchdowns, and 39 catches. So both of these guys, monster producers with pass catching upside, and that's really, really exciting. Again, the only thing that's a knock on them is the, the small school. But you can see when we look at, uh, that's the receiving upside that we'll look at in a second, but this is adjusted yards per team play. So just again, your production and your offense, how much are you sort of taking up of your offense? Are you efficient? You can see Ashton Jaunty in year one, we have compared next to Brees Hall, Bijan, Christian McCaffrey, three of the best running back prospects in the last 10 years. You have Ashton Jaunty. Again, if I'm saying that name wrong, let me know. He is between Bijan and McCaffrey. Ollie Gordon's year one, not that crazy. But then year two, McCaffrey's the only one better than Ashton Jaunty. And then you have Bijan, Ollie Gordon, and Brees Hall all bunched up. So Ollie Gordon and Jaunty out of Boise State, they are already really, really strong prospects. As long as they don't fall off in year three, you need them to be above that dotted line in year three. If they fall off. That's where we have issues. But as of right now, both look really good. Ollie Gordon, a little bit more upright. He's 6'2", 215 pounds, but really, really good stuff. Again, the receiving upside is there. When we look at receiving points per game in this class, they are Jonte at the top, Ollie Gordon at fifth. Really, again, really, really strong prospects. Then we'll get to like kind of our honorable mentions here of guys that I think could go day two. Or really their upside is day two. And I have them compared to Kenneth Walker and Javante Williams as guys who, you know, they weren't perfect running back prospects. And then they had a really big year three that pushed them up draft boards. We could see that with any of these running backs. Now, uh, I love Trevor Etienne. He's someone I'll point out. You'll see he has the second best adjusted yards per team play uh, in year one. In year two, kind of middle of the pack. He's the younger brother of Travis Etienne. He's just 19 years old. He'll be 20 years old on his draft day if he declares next year, which is really good. We like run, young stud running backs. And he is also uh, transferring to Georgia. So he's going to, you know, from Florida to Georgia, he's going to have all the scouts looking at him. You know, Georgia running backs get drafted no matter what it seems like. So that's something to keep an eye on. Uh, then you have Raheem Sanders, who has the best year two on this graphic, but then an awful year three. He's someone that was supposed to declare this year and then had such an awful year that he went from like the RB1 in this class uh, in like the 2024 class to now being kind of middle of the pack in 2025. But he's transferring to South Carolina. If he can come out here and rebound in year four, that'd be massive for him. He's someone who's really exciting as like he was like a four star athlete out of Florida. Uh, 6'2", 225 pounds, had 1,400 rushing yards and 28 catches in his second year. If he can show that he's like this monster and can catch passes, he's someone I could see definitely rebounding his stock. Uh, I'll also throw out Amarion Hampton, uh, who didn't have the best year one, but in year two, the only one that was uh, you know, right next to Raheem Sanders there. He had 1,500 rushing yards this year and 29 catches at UNC. I could see him following anywhere from you know Javante at UNC to like, your Ty Chandler at UNC is like a day three pick. We'll see how that goes. And then Damian Martinez, last guy I'll mention, he's out of Oregon State, had the best year one on this list. He's above the dotted line in year two. Uh, he's at Oregon State. He's like six foot, 235 pounds, has over a thousand yards from scrimmage in each of his first two seasons. So he's fun as well. And then I will shout out uh, two receiving studs with upside here, where if we look at uh, experience adjusted receiving market share, so just in terms of your, you know, what's the percentage of receptions you have in your offense, just your market share of the receptions in the offense, you have Donovan Edwards and Jaden Ott. Jaden Ott's a dude out of Cal. Uh, you know, that's not really like a big school or anything. Last year as a freshman, he had 46 catches. This past year, he had 25 as a sophomore, so a little bit down, but he did have 1,315 rushing yards and 12 rushing touchdowns, so... He kind of showed this year he could be all-purpose. Donovan Edwards has been, he's been pretty good. Uh, when Blake Corum went down in 2022 with his meniscus injury, 
he really stepped up and was a monster in this Michigan offense. He's had to play second fiddle behind Blake Corum. He could have a monster year this year. He's someone that catches passes. He had uh, 20 catches as a freshman, 18 as a sophomore, and 30 this past season. So if you can build on that, he's really fun. He was a big-time recruit as well that should test well. And then the last name I will throw out there is I do like Jordan James out of Oregon. I think that he was a pretty big recruit. Uh, and then he, I'll put it this way, he was more efficient than Bucky Irving last year, who's going to be an NFL running back. Uh, 7.1 yards per carry was better, had the same amount of touchdowns on less attempts. He had a better PFF rush grade. He had a better yard to contact per attempt. He looks really fun. And again, that Oregon offense is going to be fun. They brought in new quarterbacks. They brought in a new wide receiver. They have a good, op- they always have a good offensive line. So Jordan James is someone that I like as well. Now, this is where the class gets less sexy, right? The wide receivers are really, really good. The running backs are really good. And then it kind of falls off here. But I do think with this quarterback class, it's weak, but it's not quite the 2021 uh, Kenny Pickett, Malik Willis class. The issue right now is there's not a clear first. Like if I had the first overall pick, I'm not taking a quarterback. I don't know if I'm even taking a quarterback in the top 10 picks, but there's probably like, 10 or so players I would put in the mix to have your late career Jaden Daniels, Michael Penix Jr., Bo Nix type rises where they become, you know, first round topics of conversation. We saw with Baker Mayfield as well. Joe Burrow came out of nowhere in his final year. I think there's a lot of guys that are on that path in this class, and there's a lot of them. Now, when we look at the uh, Devi ADP or the Devi mock that we have been referencing this entire time for quarterback. It's tough. The top guy, Nico, out of Tennessee, I think that's Ayam Aleva. Uh, he's not in the 2025 class, but the three that are in the 2025 class in this screenshot, Shador Sanders, Carson Beck, Quinn Ewers. Those are probably your top picks right now. Those would be my, my three favorites to get drafted as the first quarterback off the board. They're not necessarily my favorite quarterbacks in this class, if that makes sense. Like I think right now they're the best bets to get draft capital this far out. First up, we'll start with Ewers. I'm not a big fan of Quinn Ewers. Uh, he was a monster in his class. Like you can see, uh, you know, the JJ McCarthy, Drake May, Caleb Williams class. He was the QB one in that class. He was supposed to be the next Trevor Lawrence. He was not. He goes to Ohio State. He then transfers to Texas. Um, and if he was the next Trevor Lawrence, he would be getting drafted this year. But instead, he's staying for his senior year at Texas. And a big issue with him not getting drafted is that he wasn't that good. A lot of people are sort of pointing out as they're watching the Xavier Worthy and the A.D. Mitchell tape that Quinn Ewers is constantly missing throws. You can see here Josh Norris, third down separation erased, right? Xavier Worthy wide open in the first screenshot, and the second one throw is way behind him. If we look at adjusted completion percentage on passes of over 20 yards, he was 50th among 73 qualified Power 5 passers with a 36.2% completion percentage. He was not good down the field. It, it's hard with Quinn Ewers. I think scouts are going to like him, right? Five-star recruit, which means you have to have some kind of talent. He's a Texas football legend. He brought them to the college football playoffs for the first time in forever. So he's like winning. He has pedigree, but then also the stuff he's put on the field so far hasn't been all that interesting. Like maybe he can, like he is somebody where I could see a Joe Burrow where like he's been, he was fine last year and then he just has like this meteoric rise and we we saw, you know, Texas is bringing in recruits in terms of wide receivers. They have Cedric Baxter, who's a really good running back. Maybe he can turn things around, but as of right now, I'm not all that sold. As well, if we look at his rushing fantasy points per game, he's not much of a scrambler. You can see he's towards the bottom of this list in rushing fantasy points per snap. He is third to last there. And then also his pressure to sack rate is over 20%. We want to see that under 20%, so not great. And then something that I use in my quarterback model uh, is QBR. Now, that's not like your dumb like quarterback rating where it's like 158.3 is the perfect score. QBR is an ESPN stat on a scale of like about 100 that measures quarterback efficiency, and it's pretty good. Here I have uh, Trevor Lawrence and Caleb Williams, you know, like two of the best prospects we've seen in a while compared to Ewers, Shador Sanders, and Carson Beck. Again, the three guys I would have as the favorites to be the first quarterback drafted. Quinn Ewers in his second year, not great. In his third year, it's really not that far off of Caleb Williams and Trevor Lawrence. We'll see where he's at in year four. Again, I would say QBR, his recruiting pedigree, are like the two things you can point at uh, with why you could like Quinn Ewers. 
Then you have Shador Sanders. He's going to have all the hype in the world, right? His dad is Deion Sanders, Travis Hunter at Colorado. We were talking about him earlier. He is someone who's talented enough to be a top 10 pick. I could see Shador Sanders being a first round pick, but to me, like he gives me like Teddy Bridgewater vibes where I don't know that he'll ever be like an exciting quarterback for fantasy. Um, for someone that like is kind of gassed up as like super mobile and is like superstar quarterback, he really doesn't run the ball a ton, right? When we look at that, uh, that same screenshot here, yeah, Shador Sanders isn't that even far off like Quint Ewers. Like he is in that 0. .0722 rushing fantasy points per snap, not even in the green really. And then also 21% pressure to sack rate, which isn't good. Like his biggest issue is that he's not giving you a ton on the ground for someone you would think is mobile and super athletic. And then also you have, uh, he led college football last year in EPA lost on sacks. So he was really, really bad in terms of taking awful sacks. So he takes bad sacks, doesn't add a ton on the ground. And then when we look at his QBR here, his first year in Power 5, he had a 63 QBR, which isn't good. We're looking for 80 plus there. So his QBR was bad. He's taking sacks. He doesn't run the ball as much as you would think. Um, you know, he gets all this hype for like being like super athletic and like a monster. I don't know. He's much more of a pocket passer. Uh, and again, he doesn't really give you much else. Uh, and then I will say the guy that I actually do like is Carson Becker. You can see year four was his first year starting at Georgia. He was a big time recruit. He waited his time behind Stetson Bennett. The fun part about him is that yes, he's a senior and he's going to be a fifth year senior this year, but he's just 21 and he'll be 22 next year. So that's really not that old. I think that that's like a similar age. Uh, like that's much younger than like your Jaden Daniels, Bo Nix, Michael Penix. So 22 at next year's draft isn't bad. 85 plus QBR in his first year as an uh, as a starting passer. And then like his, you know, he's not giving you a ton on the ground, Carson Beck, but at least his pressure to sack rate 12.2% is really, really low. Now, again, pressure to sack rate is just your, you know, what percentage of pressures are converting into sacks. So like how good are you evading sacks? He's good at evading sacks. Doesn't give you a ton on the ground, but he looks like a really good passer to me, which I think is fine. Uh, now we're going to kind of dig into guys that I really like, again, these are guys we could talk about, we could talk about next off season and these guys aren't getting drafted in, in like the top three rounds of NFL mock drafts or really even guys we talk about in rookie drafts, but there are a ton of guys again, that I think could have that meteoric rise like a Jaden Daniels, like a Joe Burrow. And the first name I'll throw out there is Dylan Gabriel. He is, uh, he went to UCF as a freshman, really good freshman year. Uh, I think he goes there twice. He had like a bad injury. He goes to Oklahoma and now he's transferring to Oregon. And you can see here his QBR kind of on pace with Jaden Daniels where it's like it's good early and then it's like kind of all over the place and like an injury and like a lot of things happen. He's going to be in like a sixth year out of high school next year. But if he goes out there and like wins a Heisman like Jaden Daniels did, uh, you know, he's going to get Evan Stewart, who we talked about earlier, transferring in could be kind of his Malik neighbors. There's a lot to work with there. He has some rushing as well, where if we look at the uh, rushing and pressure to sack rate stuff. Again, I might, I'm just going to keep this up. Uh, you can see he's like in the middle, right? So he is 0 0.0849. Uh, and then his pressure to sack rate's under 20%, which is solid. 18.9% is not amazing, but that's passable. Now, the next quarterback I want to look at as well is Jalen Milrow, who is interesting, right? We look at QBR on the left side of the screen, Jalen Milrow in year three, his first year as a starting quarterback at Alabama. He's right in that JJ McCarthy, Caleb Williams, Drake May mix in terms of QBR quarterback efficiency. Also, when we look at the best rushing fantasy points per snap career numbers in my database, he is seventh all time. The issue is, is that his 31.9% pressure to sack rate is the worst in my entire database. So he gives you a ton of rushing upside. He's a guy from Alabama who could get drafted highly. But in this next year, we really need to see that pressure to sack rate come down or else you're talking about like pretty much a, Caleb, a, a, a Malik Willis type guy. That's probably like a day two pick and probably never gets going. I will say another thing that's going for him is that he is an amazing deep throw uh, or deep passer. We're on PFF. He was the third greatest passer on 20 yards or more throws behind just Jaden Daniels and Drake May. 26 big time throws to zero turnover worthy plays on a 34.4 a dot that is all really really good stuff now again the pressure to sack rate is kind of what we don't like uh about him at this point but he's only had one year as a starter so we'll see where that goes next year now i will say as well someone else that's worth mentioning is a guy on this list here he's not in red but you can see him he's at the bottom of the screen right here riley leonard he's played at duke 
And you can see his rushing fantasy points per snap is really good. It's right in that like Dak Prescott, Kyler Murray. Uh, it's right next to Jaden Daniels as well. But instead of having that 24.5% pressure to sack rate like Jaden Daniels, 11.6% is really, really good. And he's now transferring from Duke to Notre Dame. So he'll, ha he'll be on like a national stage. Riley Leonard is really fun. I'll also point out uh, two guys with, you know, recruiting pedigree that can kind of be like J.J. McCarthy, where J.J. McCarthy wasn't really thought of as a top 10 pick last year. He was like a, a highly touted recruit and could have taken that step. Two guys that I think could take that step this year would be Drew Allar and Connor Weigman for Penn State and for Texas A&M. You can see here they are both five-star recruits in their class. And when we look at their pressure to sack rates, they are the lowest in this class, both under 12%. So that's really good as well. They don't take bad snap. They don't take bad sacks. Five-star pedigree. They could take a huge step forward. Uh, Weigman's been banged up, but he did have a 90-plus PFF pass grade in his four games last year. I'll also mention Jackson Dart. Again, there's a lot of these guys, fellas. There's a lot of them. I'll also mention Jackson Dart, uh, who was highly touted in this class ahead of May, ahead of, or like right in the mix with May and McCarthy as a four-star guy in the class that got drafted this year. And we can see he just is coming off his best year at Ole Miss, where he had 23 touchdowns, five picks, 9.3 yards per attempt is pretty good. 88.7 uh, passing grade was 10th best in college football. Not terrible. And when we look at his uh, pressure to sack rate as well, it is not bad, right? Jackson Dart, 0 0.0889, right above Dylan Gabriel, better pressure to sack rate. He's someone to definitely keep an eye on. Uh, and then I'll also throw out DJ Uwangalele, who... I like, I think that he could get draft capital. Uh, he was a five-star recruit between Bryce Young and CJ Stroud. He fills in for Trevor Lawrence, has an awful, awful year too. But now he's coming off the best year of his career at Oregon State. And now he's transferring to Florida State, who was really good last year. And that could like put him in the national spotlight, uh, DJ Uangalele, who in his best year last year, he had above an 80 QBR. And you can see here as well, something that's been his issue has been taking bad sacks. Uh, he had just minus 6.8 EPA lost with sacks last year, which was less than pretty much everyone on this list besides Bo Nix, which is really impressive. So he doesn't take bad sacks. He was efficient last year. He's transferring to a better school. Uh, he's someone that could have that Jaden Daniels type, you know, Bo Nix type rise here where that year two was really, really bad. Year three, a little bit better. And then year four, really good. So if you can build on that, that's fun. Also a career 14.2% pressure to sack rate. Not bad at all. And then the last two guys I'll mention is Noah Fafita out of Arizona. So he's with McMillan. And then you have Jalen Daniels. Not related to Jaden Daniels, but he goes to Kansas. And when we sort age 20 QBR seasons, Jalen Daniels has a 90, which is pretty crazy. And then Fafita has an 85.6. These are all 85 pluses all time. And it's a pretty good list just in terms of getting draft capital, right? Tua, Justin Fields, Bradford, CJ Stroud, Mariota, Pat White. Uh, Pat White, I think was a second or third round pick, but everyone else was a first round pick in that list. McCarthy first round, Bryce Young first, Trevor Lawrence first, Deshaun Watson, Manziel, Caleb Williams, all first. Dak was a fourth, but someone that probably should have been drafted earlier. Tim Tebow, Lamar, both really good. And then Jake Fromm's the only one who's not good. So two guys to keep an eye on as well out of this class. And then I'll also even throw out, who did I want to throw out? Uh, Will Howard here. He has pretty good rushing fantasy points per snap just behind Wagman. Uh, 0.1206, and then a really good pressure to sack rate of 11.5%. So he can scramble. He doesn't take bad sacks. He transfers to Ohio State. Ohio State has a bunch of guys that could play quarterback right now. They like they they brought uh, Will Howard in. I think they transferred Julian Sayan, who's like this Alabama five star, and then they also like recruited a four star guy that could be in the mix. We don't know who's going to start at quarterback. If it is Will Howard, I could see him elevating his draft stock. Now moving off of that, we have tight ends which. Without your, you know, Brock Bowers or Kyle Pitts, it's hard to project, right? Like, a lot of random stuff happens. A lot of it's athletic testing as well to get drafted highly. But the only tight end that, like, really sticks out in this class that I like a ton is Colston Loveland. He is the Michigan tight end. He was second on that team in receiving, almost paced Roman Wilson, who's going to be a top 50 pick in this NFL draft. He is this, like, four-star tweener tight end, 6'5", 230 pounds, which is, like, this receiving specialist. He's a converted wide receiver. Uh... And his year two, with that 45 for 650 yards and four touchdown season, looks really strong here. When we look at receiving yards per team pass attempt, his year one, not that great. But year two, literally right next to Brock Bowers. Again, I don't think that he's Brock Bowers, but he's someone that I could see going round two. Uh, if he tests well, maybe round one. 
he's really fun. Now, after that, you have just kind of like a like a grab bag of tight ends you can talk through. Uh, Aronde Gadsden the second. His dad played in the NFL. He's like this wide receiver tight end tweener. Uh, he really only has one full year of playing. He didn't really get on the field in year one. He got hurt in year three, but that year two is literally ahead of Brock Bowers. Really, really strong year two, but he's someone that could go like day three. I don't really know where he's going to end up. You have Justin Jolly, who has two good years of production there, right? Like the second best freshman year, uh, but he played at UConn, but he's now trained from the NC State, so he'll have the opportunity to show himself against power five opponents. And then RJ Maryland's a guy out of SMU to kind of like look at, but really not all that interesting. Now, that takes us to how do we feel about this class as a whole, right? In trade talks, when we're entertaining those deals and we're looking to trade them away or trade for them, how should we value them? Well, I wouldn't value them like the 2023 class or the 2024 class, right? Where we had like sort of crown jewels in those classes um, of like, you know, Bijan Robinson and Marvin Harrison Jr. and Caleb Williams. But it's not an awful class, right? It's, it, it's not terrible. I would call it like a B to B plus, right? The wide receivers are the strongest part of this class. You have Burden and McMillan, both guys that could go top 10 in the NFL draft. Both guys already elite in my RS grading system. And both guys a legendary upside. Then you have Evan Stewart and Yemeka Egbuka. Emeka Egbuka out of Ohio State. I'm never going to bet against them. Both guys, first round upside, could definitely be elite wide receiver prospects. Then you have the running back class where there are five dudes contending for RB1. All of them look strong. All of them in contention to go day two, be elite running back prospects. That's all great. And they can kind of pollinate a dying running back position. The issue is that there's not a quarterback to anchor, right? There is no Caleb. There is no Trevor Lawrence. And that's kind of the downfall. There isn't this like clear 101 to anchor this class. And that's the downfall. Now, again, I don't think that it's quite your, you know, your Kenny Pickett, your Malik Willis uh, class where there's just like nothing at quarterback. I think we will get something or someone. Uh, but it is definitely, you know, when eight of the top 12 or nine of the top 12 startup picks are quarterbacks, you'd like to have a top quarterback in your draft class. So again, I'd give it like a B, B plus. Tight ends are super hard to predict this far out, but I do like Colston Loveland. So I wouldn't be paying the iron price, but they're definitely nothing to sneeze at. Like if I'm a rebuilding team and I'm tearing everything down and I'm sitting at like the 109 or the 110 and someone offers me a 2025 first and a little juice on top, I don't mind it. I'd probably value a 2025 first, probably anywhere from that like 109 to 112 area. The top eight picks, I'm not sending for a 25 first, but if you can turn a late first into a 25 first, I don't hate that as well. Especially again, if you're not trying to win in 2024, it's never bad to trade for future capital, let that value build up and then figure out what to do with it elsewhere as you, you know, gain more value to your team. So again, nothing to sneeze at. I, I wouldn't just like toss 2025 first to the side, but I also wouldn't, you know, mortgage your entire team to build 2025 like they're a draft class that i wouldn't mind having two or three of on teams where i'm rebuilding just to build future draft capital so that's going to do it for us today i do enjoy breaking down the future classes i feel like everyone kind of has at this point we're all just waiting for the nfl draft everyone kind of has 2024 rookie class fatigue so it is fun to talk about the next class how we, we should be valuing them in trade talks all of that good stuff again if you are an absolute sicko a pervert if you will and you are in Devi or you're curious enough to want to know about the 2025 and 2026 draft classes, those RS grades are live on Patreon. You have to be a gold member or better. So that's all on Patreon, patreon.com slash Ron Stewart. You can find the, the link in the description in the comment section down below. But if you can't support there, just leave a like, subscribe. I'm pumping out content for you guys in the month of April. Exciting, exciting month. I think that we're going to get, uh, I got to kind of like update the dinosaur rankings this week and get things sorted out. And then we're going to be locked and loaded for content the rest of the month we're gonna have like rookie comps we can go through uh and a lot of cool stuff so be on the lookout for that and as always i appreciate you guys watching and i will see y'all in the next one